If you're a member and you don't have a copy of the book, you can raise your hand and I'm sure somebody will get you one. <laughs> or maybe everybody's got one. Good. Okay. I feel really loud, so I'm going to slide that down. Wait, somebody needs one? <laughs> Jason's going to get you one somehow or some way. <laughs> All right. So it's good to see everybody out this morning. Beautiful morning. Um, and, it, and always, anytime we can come together as God's people, good day to be here and to fellowship in our worship and in our study at this time. So I appreciate you being here. Um, I want to give just a really quick update before, I, before even I go to prayer. Usually I don't see people going that door, so that was weird. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so, as you all know, my sister-in-law and brother-in-law, Adam and Esther Leverett, were in an accident Thursday morning uh, down in Florida. They were there for their honeymoon. What a lousy way to spend a honeymoon. Um, so, just to real briefly, uh, they were in their rental car. They, somebody ran a red light, T-boned them. Uh, Adam is still in the hospital, uh, improving, but slowly. Esther was able to get out yesterday. Uh, she was able to go and see him yesterday, uh, which I heard was a very... Uh, emotional uh, reunion, hadn't seen each other since the accident uh, Thursday morning, so uh, really tough. So from my family's perspective, I thank you all. Uh, you all have prayed, uh, you've offered, and, and I know I had to send an email out to tell you to basically <laughs> stop texting them. Um, I hate saying stuff like that, but Esther was overwhelmed, almost literally. Um, it's a good thing that you love and you care that much. She just couldn't deal with it right then. Um, so we, we all sincerely thank you. I know Adam and Esther thank you. Uh, we are praising God that they're alive uh, because they very easily could not be. Um, so I'll try not to get too emotional because uh, I love those two a lot. So thank you very much. Uh, and the family appreciates all of you. All right. Before we go into our study this morning, let's go to God and pray together, please. Our Holy Father, as we gather this morning... What a blessing it is to be in your presence. What a, a tremendous honor, and we recognize the price that it took for us to be here, that Jesus' blood sacrificed at Calvary gives us this avenue uh, to come to you. Uh, not only to be in your presence with prayer, but to be in your presence with worship, as we've been studying. And so, God, we pray that you fill our hearts with gratitude, uh, that the spirit um, that we understand through your word and that we gather from the gift of, uh, that we have through Jesus, we pray that that is alive in us, that we do our best to give you everything that we have in our praise and our worship. And we pray as we, in, in, in this study, that we have open hearts and open minds, that we look to, to mine your word, to see what we can learn uh, to be better, whether that is understanding or simply uh, looking to see what other Christians or other people of God have done throughout history, uh, we pray that it teaches us and, and leads us in the right direction. And God, we pray for this church, that it is strong, that it is spiritually active, that it seeks and saves the loss of this world because we need to love them like you loved us. And help us to pay that forward in seeking them out, no matter where they are, no matter who they are, no matter what they've done. Your mercy is sufficient and pray that we would be active in showing that hope to other people that keeps us uh, full of joy. Father, we love you, we thank you for loving us, and we pray in Jesus' name, amen. All right, so let's begin classes today with a question. Or we are, or, nope. <laughs> let's start over. Are we temporal people, temporary, earthly, whatever, or are we eternal people? <laughs> yes. That's usually a good answer when a, when a teacher or a preacher asks an either-or question. Um, I'm going to say that you're an eternal person, and we're going we're gonna to understand why. Um, so we're going to study mostly in John 14 today, but I want to look in 1 Corinthians 15 first, just to set the stage. In 1 Corinthians 15, I'm not going to read the entire chapter, though it is very much worth reading. But we're going to start in verse 20. So in 1 Corinthians 15 and beginning there in verse 20, Paul writes, But in fact Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. 
For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive, but each in his own order. Christ the first fruits, then at his coming those who belong to Christ. Christians, that's you. You are those who belong to Christ. And if Christ has been raised from the dead, and Paul makes that argument in 1 Corinthians 15, that of course he has been raised from the dead, it is obvious, and you know that, then guess what? You are going to be raised from the dead too, never to die again, which makes you eternal. That's kind of a mind-blowing thing to consider this morning, isn't it? Because if you're like me, you woke up this morning with you know, a little bit of back pain and and your knee kind of creaking when you walked, and everything pops whenever you move, and you think, I don't feel very eternal, <laughs> but you are. And that's a wonderful thing. So, um, <laughs> I'm thinking about this. Sean told me the other day, the, the Mark Twain quote, never use a 10-cent word when a 5-cent word will do, and yet here I go. Uh, the, word <laughs> is, the word is eschatology, and I use it a lot. Um, but what it really means is just the study, the theological study of end times, of things that happen at the end, the destiny of your eternal being, where are you going to go? And I use this because there, it's really the quickest way to say those things. It's hard to say, to sum up, you know, who we are without using a word like eschatological. We are, we are to be an eschatological people. I can say that better than that, I promise. Because we should be some people who focus on eternal things, because that's who we are. And when we're able to do that, we are able to be much better servants of God, because we don't get so distracted by the things of this world. And if that's ever applied to my family, it's applied in the last week. When the things of this world, which are incredibly important, because people are involved... But we recognize that there is something greater down the road. And we can keep our focus on those things, then we can give God better. Better service, better obedience, better worship. And so I want to challenge you, if you're not someone who thinks about eschatology, if you're not someone who thinks about where we're all going to end up, then I challenge you to do that. I think it will make your life richer. I think it will make your spiritual life richer when you recognize that we will be resurrected to never die again and to live eternally with God the Father. If that doesn't you know, give you some cold chills, think again. <laughs> Keep thinking about it and meditating about it until it really just shakes you because that's an amazing thing. So how does that apply in worship? Well, like I said, we're going to look a lot in John 14, and some of that is in John 14. So... Kind of blending eschatology into our worship, let's read the first seven verses of John 14. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am you may be also. And you know the way to where I am going. Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. So I want to talk just for a few moments about this idea. That in my Father's house are many rooms. And you may have different translations. It may say many mansions. Um... What Jesus is doing here is shifting their focus, and he is particularly talking to his apostles. Uh, there are some things, I've, I've already had that conversation this week too. When you say you're going to teach on John 14, people call you, or people walk up to you and talk to you, what are you going to say about John 14? Um, so I want to clear something. A lot of this is directed at the 12. There are some, etern some really important, universal, eternal truths here that apply to all of us. So one of the things is there is eternity, and that is eternity with God. So Jesus is focusing or shifting their focus to that. He's trying to get them to think about that. So he talks about having a room or a place prepared, a place where Jesus will be, and it's in God's dwelling place. 
all those are really amazing things. What I think sometimes Christians, where I think sometimes we make a mistake, is trying to picture what heaven will be for me, right? Um, you, you think about the movie Field of Dreams. Everyone remember, remember the movie Field of Dreams? My son hates that movie. What a weirdo. Anyway, um, <laughs> in that movie, you know, uh, Kevin Costner plows up his cornfield in Iowa and makes a baseball field. And the baseball players come from out of the corn, the, the dead and gone baseball players come in and they say, is this heaven? And he says, no, it's Iowa, which is not quite like heaven. Um, but for those baseball players, the baseball field was Iowa, right? For some people, you know, it's, it's a field filled with puppies or something. I, do we really think that's what heaven is like? We sing a song, and I, I, I hate to say this because I know someone has, has led it. Mansion just over the hilltop, I don't like that song. Um, but I'm going to tell you why. <laughs> because it talks about having a gold one that's silver lined. And my thought every time we read, the, we sing those words is, I don't care. I don't care what the dwelling place is like. I don't care what the walls are made of. I don't care what the trim is. I don't care if it's got brushed nickel. I don't care. I'm with God the Father eternally. That's the blessing. Not the place. It's the company that we will keep eternally. The dwelling place of God is with man. That's the blessing. And when Jesus talks about eternity, I think that's what he wants us to focus on. When he says, in my Father's house are many rooms or many mansions, don't be thinking about what kind of apartment you're going to have. Be thinking about that you're going to dwell with God and with the Son eternally. That's the blessing. Right? I hope I didn't offend anyone who likes the song, Mansion Over the Hilltop. You can love that song. My opinion means just about nothing. <laughs> All right, so... How does this affect our worship? Well, look in Revelation chapter 19, verses 6 through 8. You don't have to, you don't have to turn there. I've got it up on the screen. Uh, if you turn there, you, you want to, you're more than welcome to. There it says, Hallelujah, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him the glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself in, with fine linen, bright and pure. When that glimpse into, into God's dwelling place, into heaven, there is worship. There is worship of God by the angels and the elders and all that in those scenes. And beings in that heavenly realm are worshiping God with words like this. Talking about the marriage of the Lamb. So here's a nice warm-up question. Who is the Lamb? Christ is the Lamb. And who is the Lamb's bride? The church. We are. In heaven, you know, I would assume currently, I don't, can't see it, there is worship of God going on about our destination, about the marriage of the Lamb that is Christ to his church that is us. So if worship in heaven is good, is, can focus on our eschatology, then we can and it ought to inspire us because that is what the work of the cross was all about. Seeking and saving you and everyone else for that eternal reunion. You know, I talked about that. I didn't intend to, to blend these uh, two things. But I talked about that, Adam and Esther, you know, when they were separated for four days after an accident. And their reunion was tearful. And I'm sure joyful and I can't imagine all the emotions for God, he's been separated from his children by our sin for a long, long time. Now, time's a lot different to God than it is to us. But there's going to be a reunion. And how are we going to feel in that reunion? What kind of joy, what kind of, you know, relief, what kind of just effervescent uh, joy will be bubbling out of us when we, re we are reunited with the creator and the sustainer of the universe that's worship worthy, right? That's the sort of thing that we can focus on when we come to worship and it helps us sing a little bit better, a little bit louder. You may not sing better. Jim tried to coach you into singing better on Wednesday, but I, some of you just are beyond hope. Um, but you can sing a little bit loud. That's a joke. You sing fine. 
Um, but you can sing a little bit louder, a little bit better. You can pray a little bit harder with more focus. You can meditate longer. You can read more scripture. All those things are possible when we focus on where we are bound and the sureness of that. We, uh, we had fourth Fridays this week, and one of the things we often talk about with the kids, um, teens and almost teens, is we sometimes do a poor job of communicating how sure their salvation is. When you become a Christian, it is not as if you begin, you begin tap dancing through this minefield of potential hiccups that will cost you your soul. That's not really how this works. Now, if you want to reject and rebel, you want to reject God and rebel, yes, that will cost you your soul. No one's saying that it's just locked down tight forever and there's nothing can change it. But God won't change it. You will. You'll make that decision, and it will be a decision. If it's a mistake and you decide not to fix that mistake, that's a decision. But we, we, so many times I think the kids think it's just they're walking on eggshells spiritually, and we want to communicate. That's not the case. And to you, I want to communicate. That's not the case. You are in God's sure hand. And you will not be falling out of that hand unless you leap out. And that's a decision you'll make. So that's, again... God is worth praising because of that goodness and that mercy. All right, I've talked a lot already. So any questions or comments before I move forward? And I hate saying any questions or comments. That's real bland. I'll get these guys. <laughs> Thanks, Matt. I just wanted to say I appreciate you making that last comment about walking on eggshells. Because I had somebody approach me about that. And I said, well, there's not a meter above your head that throughout the day, going to heaven, going to hell, going to heaven, going to hell. There's, some, there's not this meter... Now, obviously, if I went out and robbed a bank and killed a bunch of people, obviously that sin has been in my heart for a while, and I've been going down that path for a while. So, you know, I've had people come to me worried about that, and I said, there's not this magical meter above your head that's constantly going back and forth, like a, like a volume meter on an on a audio board or something. Right. Very good. Right. Travis, I think you mentioned a few moments ago the joy of heaven. Mm-hmm. I don't think mankind on earth can reach that joy. I think that'll be above in anything we can appreciate. I really believe that. That's my opinion, mine only maybe, but that's what I think. Yeah, I would share that opinion. Um, I would absolutely share that opinion. I often think about uh, when I was in college, I had a Bible study with some guys, and a guy made this comment, a guy that I really respect and like a lot. He said, you know, there's probably a reason why we don't know how great heaven is, because we'd never take the first bit of medicine we drive recklessly. We wouldn't wear our seatbelts. I mean, that sort of thing. We'd be in such a hurry to get there, we would be reckless. You know, not suicidal, just not careful. You know, we, we, would, go, we would go to the Grand Canyon and walk to the part that doesn't have a rail. Did you know there's a part of the Grand Canyon that doesn't have a rail? It's terrifying to me. I hate heights. Uh, but if I, was, if I really knew what it was like to be, you know, with God eternally, I'd probably just stroll right up there and be kicking rocks and stuff. James McClenney has a comment. When you talk about heaven and the whether or not we're there and the confidence that we have that you were talking about with the kids, you know, the Revelation talks about the names written in the book of the Lamb and the names can be erased from that book. I think sometimes we think God's sitting there and he's wearing out the erasers and, and having to resharpen the pencil every five minutes for us. And it's not like that at all. Right. Very good. Very good. Good comments, guys. Thank you. All right. So next question. Should our worship only be directed to the Father? That's an interesting question, isn't it? Well, look at what Jesus says. He says, believe in God, believe also in me. He says, if you had known me, you would, know, you would have known my Father also. And he also says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. Is there a difference between the Father and the Son? <laughs> yes. Is the Son God? Yes. Is the Holy Spirit God? Yes, keep doing that. Yeah, that's right. So can we worship, you know, only the Father? No, we can have thoughts in our worship of also praising the Son and the Spirit. That's God. Um, you know, Yahweh God, the Father, has a very specific role. And, you know, it's, it's from Genesis to Revelation. But so does the Son. And so does the Spirit. 
So those things are in there. Sometimes it's not as easy for us to see those shadows of Christ in the Old Testament. Um, the Spirit is pretty obvious throughout. But we can worship those, all three of those entities because they are all God. I don't think there's anything wrong uh, with that at all. Okay, moving on. Uh, continuing in John chapter 14, actually we've already read this, but at verse 6, if you recall it says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. We all know that passage very well. Let's think about it for a moment. What does it mean that Jesus says, I am the way? How would you word that? You would say it's a package deal. All right, I'm going to make you talk more about that. What does it mean it's a package deal? Well, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. Have all three. Trinity. Yeah. Yeah. So we have to have all three. All three of them play a very important role in salvation um, at different roles. So when Jesus is the way, that there's, there's something to that specifically. What does that, what does that mean to you? All right, so he didn't say he was one of the ways, is what Keith said. He said he's the only way. Um, all right, so Todd says in Matthew 28, 18, uh, all, Jesus says, all power is granted into me in heaven and, uh, and on earth. What did Jesus do that makes him so uniquely qualified to be the way to God and to have all the authority and power given to him. What did he do? He gave his life. Oh, say it again. He gave, his life. he gave his life. He gave his perfect life. He was the perfect sacrifice. No one else was qualified to do that. And he was God incarnate. So that perfect sacrifice gets amped up quite a bit when the word becomes flesh and becomes a sacrifice for our sins. So because of that, he is the only access to the Father. And the, again, it's not happenstance. He didn't, he's not, like, he didn't draw the right straw. He did the work. All right, Jesus also says he is the truth. What does that mean to you? He is the all in all, John says. Absolutely. What else? There, there were no other options, correct, Jim? Everything else is false. All right, every, everything else is false, yeah. So by process of elimination, <laughs> Jesus can be the truth. Uh, John, there's a microphone coming. Yep, you just got to wait just a second. See, there it is. Jesus himself, especially in the book of Luke and other places, he said his uh, sacrifice and his death gave us a new covenant, which is what we're under today. All right, so it's because of Jesus we have the new covenant, and that's exactly right. And you talked about his sacrifice and his death. When Jesus came and he, and he offered himself to be sacrificed on the cross, was that the first time we'd ever heard of such a thing? Let me know. That's a bad way to word that question. Did we have any indication that the Messiah would do something like that? Yeah, we had plenty of indication, right? We had all sorts of prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus. And Jesus is the truth because he fulfills all those prophecies perfectly. Because no one else can. Because he's uniquely qualified. All right, one more thing. Jesus is the life. Um, I'm going to ask you to to really specifically get in my frame of mind to answer this question. Jesus is also the rock. You think about an Old Testament story where the rock and life and maybe, and, and what, what? Water. And water. Very good. Thank you, Carrie. I didn't even tell her that beforehand. She's just that smart. Yeah, so <laughs> when, the, when the water comes from the rock, when Moses goes and is supposed to speak to the rock, strikes the rock, water comes from the rock. That life-giving water comes from the rock. Jesus is the source of life for us, not by his water, but by his blood. But there are lots of great passages to talk about uh, Jesus and being that, that life-giving spring that I don't have time to dive into, but man, I wish I did. So yeah, that, those are great reasons for us to consider worshiping 
uh, considering Jesus when we worship. Let's keep moving. All right, and, and back in John 14, beginning in verse 12, there he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. So, this is a very interesting passage. When Jesus says, greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. How could anyone following Jesus do a greater work than what he is doing? Because he has provided heaven for us, so we can help provide heaven to somebody else. The key to understanding this passage is to see what Jesus says. When he said, let, let's read verse 12 again. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me, that should be us, will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because why? Because Jesus is going to the Father. Because Jesus has made the sacrifice and opens up the path to heaven. Because Jesus gives us access to the Father. And because Jesus will now be at the Father's right hand as an intercessor, as a paraclete. We're going to talk about that word, another one of those 10 cent words. I'm sorry, Sean. Um, that's, that's a specific, unique role that Jesus has. And it doesn't mean that we're going to do something greater than be resurrected, you know, or to die on behalf of everybody's sins. What it means is that we can have great accomplishment in the kingdom by telling the gospel to people, by sharing the good news and the mercy and the hope and the love, by being obedient Christians and trying to share that with everybody. That's a really big deal. And Jesus wants us to understand that. So, I think the proper way to understand this is that Jesus unlocks <clears throat> salvation through his death, burial, and resurrection. That changes everything on what his people do, right? Thus, greater works are unlocked, so we can do great works. And Christians, we ought to use this ability. And we ought to pray for lost souls. I don't think we do that nearly enough um, as individuals and as a church. Praying for the lost souls is part of our worship. That's, that's a task that we are blessed to be able to undertake. So I think we ought to think about those things. Jesus also said in this passage, whatever you ask in my name. And so we close every prayer with, in Jesus' name, amen. And it becomes rote, uh, and I understand why it does. Um, you know, from the time we teach Sophia the same thing. So from the time you're three years old, you're wording prayers and saying, in Jesus' name, amen. But I think we need to really understand what that means. That is because of Jesus' authority and access that we're able to, to say these prayers. I'll get it, Matt. Thank you, though. Todd, Todd mentioned Matthew uh, 28, 18 about Jesus having the authority on earth, right? Mm -hmm. And you're talking about authority, we pray in Jesus' name. All right? And, and Jesus, of course, paid the price for our prayers to be heard so we don't have to go through the priest and the temple and all that. They go, the, that wall of the temple is torn down, and our prayers go directly to the Father. And he did that. Now, think about this for a second. If you're pulled over for a speeding ticket, that cop, in the authority of the law, can give you that ticket. Mm -hmm. uh, back in the colonial days, I'm going to arrest you in the name of the crown. Right? That's a representative of that authority, right? Jesus bought that authority. He paid for that authority. So when we use that in Jesus' name, we are appealing to that authority that he bought and paid for, for our prayer to be heard. Yeah. That's how dear those prayers are, and they are offering unto heaven. Very good. All right. Uh, hopefully, obviously, it needs to be within God's will. Uh, we don't need to be praying for anything outside of that. We shouldn't want anything outside of that. But I don't want to digress and, and chase that rabbit. Okay. Where does this start? Where does all of this start? If we're going to worship God because of who he is, what he has done, if we're going to consider his son 
and the great work that he has done, then what I think it, that's interesting. Oh, there was a whole other slide. Well, that really ruins the segue. <laughs> all right, let's just get all that up there. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Gerald, go ahead. You, you, you probably don't want to go down that rabbit hole, so I probably shouldn't go down that rabbit hole. But I, right, that, thank you, Gerald, for your comment. <laughs> <laughs> you know, God wanted to wipe out um, all of Israel, and Moses pleaded and begged, said, don't do that. Please don't do that. Kill me. You know, do whatever you need to do. And God changed his mind. I think we need to pray in faith. Um, sometimes I think in, God, in, in God's will is a, is a, is a cop-out. Um, I think we need to pray earnestly to God for the things that we want in our life. Now, sometimes we're going to get a yes, sometimes we're going to get a no, and sometimes we're going to get a wait. But I think we plead like Moses. We plead for him to change his mind. We plead for, we, we you know, we, we can disagree with God. Moses did. Um, and I think it's a great example. And um, so, I, like I said, I, I, I think we, we go to him earnestly in faith and, and pray and uh, and, 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 and leave it up to him at that point. I guess an excellent comment. And you're, I don't, you're right, I don't want to go down that rabbit hole but, because it's a really interesting conversation, but I agree with you. Um, we, we can pray, well, yes, I'll just say I agree with you. I don't going to be able to word it any better than you did. Thank you. Um, all right, in, in verse 15, we talked about obedience. Um, Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. You shall worship the Lord your God and him only shall you serve. He says that in Matthew chapter 4 and verse 10. But also in Matthew, he talks about love in verse, or chapter 15, verses 8 and 9. This people honors me with their lips, he's quoting, uh, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching his doctrine, the commandments of men. This is, and we talked about this earlier when we talked about Isaiah chapter 1. There is, a way, there is a wrong way to do things right. We can do all the right things and still not be pleasing to God if we leave love out. It begins with love, specifically with agapeo love. And there in chapter 14, verse 23, and we've not read that yet, Jesus says, if anyone loves me, agapeo, agapeo or however you say it, <laughs> um, agape is so much easier, I should have just stuck with that one. He will keep my word and my father will love him and we will come to him and make our home with him. This is all dependent on love, on a God level love, for no better way to put that. So, again, don't get so caught up in saying your prayer in Jesus' name and not think about what that means and the sacrifice it took for that. Don't get so caught up in going through the melody of a song and forget what you're saying and who you're singing with and who you're singing to. Those sorts of things. Don't let the mechanics take your heart out of it. The mechanics are important, sure they are, but it starts with love. So remember that. All right, so when Jesus is telling all of his apostles this, and we're getting, uh, getting closer to the end of his life, there obviously is going to have to be some concern. As they get closer and closer to understanding that Jesus is not going to be with them forever, they have to be starting to get, have to be, uh, begin worrying, and Jesus tells them that help is coming. And he tells them this here, beginning in verse 16 in John 14. We're going to read down through verse 27. And I will ask the Father, and he will give you another helper to be with you forever, even the Spirit of truth, whom the world cannot receive, because it neither sees him nor knows him. You know him, for he dwells with you and will, will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world will see me no more, but you will see me. Because I live, you also will live. In that day you will know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Whoever has my commandments and keeps them, he it is who loves me. And he who loves me will be loved by my Father, and I will love him and manifest myself to him. Judas, not Iscariot, said to him, Lord, how is it that you will manifest yourself to us and not to the world? Jesus answered, If anyone loves me, he will keep my word, and my Father will love him, and we will come to him and make our home with him. Whoever does not love me does not keep my words, and the word that you hear is not mine, but the Father's who sent me. These things I have spoken to you while I am still with you. But the Helper, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, he will teach you all things and bring to remembrance all that I have said to you. So this is where it gets hairy, right? 
when we start talking about the Holy Spirit here and what the promise is, it's important to understand who the promises are to. Some of this is very specific to the apostles. This Holy Spirit cannot bring to your remembrance all the things you experienced when you walked with Christ because you didn't. You didn't walk with Jesus when he walked on the earth. So the Spirit does not do that for you. The Spirit's not going to give you spiritual gifts so that you can speak in tongues, so that you can heal people, etc. You're not going to get that. But I would refer you again, and we talked about this already in this class, to Romans 8. Don't discount the Holy Spirit. Don't dumb it down because we don't fully understand it. Um, it does more than we tend to give it uh, credit for doing. Give him credit for doing. We also should personalize the Spirit, but that's a whole other can of worms, I guess, to open. So he tells the apostles they will not be abandoned. He says the Spirit will come. And he also says that Jesus, will, that he will come back and be with them. He says he's going to come and make his home with them. He leaves them with peace. And one of the ways that he leaves them with peace is by giving them this fuller understanding that the Spirit gives them. Again, with the, with the apostles, we're looking particularly like Acts 2, or when Jesus breathed on them. They obviously received something that we did not receive. But I think one of the keys here is to understand uh, is, is in verse 16, I will ask the Father, he will give you another helper to be with you forever. And again, trying to parcel out what's a, what's a promise to the apostles and what's a promise to us, I think the key word is forever. Because I think that moves it beyond just what the apostles are going to have. Now again, the Spirit manifests differently to us than it does to them, and in different ways. But, the Spirit is still important. All right, got to keep moving here. Um, this helper, and that's, you know, again, this is one of these Greek words, parakletos. This is a fascinating word. It's only used in two places in Scripture. It's used here when Jesus is talking about the Holy Spirit, and it's also used in 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1, talking about Jesus. So I've heard this analogy, um, and I think it's a great one, a great way to understand it. Think of us as being one piece of fabric separated from God who's another piece of fabric. And the parakletos, or the two of them, are going to be the thread that pulls us together. Jesus comes down, that's one thread, and loops in. And then Jesus ascends to the Father, which goes back and pulls. So Jesus comes, represents the Father to us, and then after he lives his life, he's die, he dies, he's buried, he's resurrected, he ascends back to the Father to represent us to the Father, always making intercession for them. That's us. But he sends the Spirit back down, so here comes another thread, representing God to us again in the same word, parakletos. Parakletos just means an advocate, someone called to your side for help. Jesus was called to our side. Now he's called to the Father's side, and the Spirit comes, and it's on our side, and that thread pulls us closer together. Man, I hope I said that well, because I think it's a powerful analogy. I just don't know if I always explain it very well. But so those are the roles. Jesus is now at the Father's side. The Holy Spirit is now with us and will be forever. So this spirit of truth, Jesus says, you know him for he dwells in you and will be in you. So it is something that is more than we tend to give it credit for being. What we can understand is that, well, I'm not going to say that. I'm not even going to go there. I'm just going to move on. <laughs> All right. Finishing up this thought. The two things the Holy Spirit is told to do in this passage is to teach and to give remembrance. All right. I think most of us in the Church of Christ tend to understand that aspect of it. Um, I think there's a great deal more, traditional, not traditionally, scripturally, from beginning to end, the Holy Spirit brings life. It is the breath of God. It has a tremendous role in that. And is identified in Scripture as being that thing that comes within you that equips you to be eternal. So it's a lot more, I think, than just God's written word. There's a whole lot, and we're not doing a Holy Spirit study. I would love to do a Holy Spirit study, um, but probably not taught by me. <laughs> that's, that's some really heavy stuff. So I want to, want to close this thought with this. 
we have such great and precious promises, just like the apostles did. And the apostles were encouraged to look forward by Jesus in this chapter. We are encouraged to look forward, to be eschatological, to be people who think about where we will spend eternity. And that is a deep and wide thought of what it costs to get us there, uh, the people who are going with us, the people who go before us. Um, one of the questions that we ask the hosts of Fourth Fridays is, you know, who are you looking forward to meeting in eternity? You ever think, think about that question? I mean, there are some really excellent answers. That's a great thing to consider. But it ought to inspire our worship because that's our destination. And there's a lot that happened to get us there. Any questions or comments before we go to the questions in the book? Carrie has a comment. And, well, no, you can't talk yet, Carrie. There's a microphone. There's a whole protocol. I just <laughs> want to know the verse that the other paracleti, para, whatever that word, kletos. Paracletos. I missed it. Sorry. It is 1 John chapter 2 and verse 1. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah. It's a, it's a really fascinating study uh, to think about that and meditate on that. All right, so to the questions. First question, what does it mean when Jesus says, believe in God, believe also in me? What do you think that means? He's telling you one thing. He's telling you one thing. He's telling you a very important thing. What is it that he's specifically trying to tell you? Yeah, that Jesus, and that's, that's exactly right, that Jesus is the path to God. If you believe in God, Jesus says, it's not a leap to believe in me because I'm God. I'm part of the Godhead. He says, so this, this is not a stretch. To believe in one to, is to believe in the other. Good. How does Jesus play an integral part in our prayers? We've talked about this, but how does he do that? All right, he is our mediator. And again, that's that role. He's our parakletos. He is the one sitting at God's hand making intercession for us. And thank God for that, literally, because we probably don't know how to pray for all the things that we should. Holy Spirit plays an interesting role there, too. But I told you, this is not a Holy Spirit study, so you just have to sit on that. All right, last, do you think the Holy Spirit plays a role in our worship? Yes. How? All right, at very least, he provides the word. I agree with that. How else might he? Ain't nobody doing that. <laughs> no one is like, I'm going to walk out on that plank by myself. That's okay. Think about those things, though. Study, study about it. Um, again, I encourage you to study more about the Spirit. I think there's a whole lot more we can glean from that. Um, and I would commend to you that Ryan Cummings at the Manslick Road Church did a fantastic 27-part Holy Spirit study during COVID. That is amazing, and I would really commend that to you. Um, excellent job. Of course, Ryan, you know, for those of you who knew Ryan when he was here, he's brilliant, so of course he did, but it's really good. Any other questions or comments before we close? Yes, Todd. He's talking to 11 apostles. He's not talking to 12. Judas has already gone away to betray him. So when he's telling these men, that these men that he's talking to don't know this, mm -hmm. but we do. And he says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. The comforter is coming. The comforter is coming for 11 of them, okay, that's mm -hmm. going to help. It's not coming for all of them. I don't know if they realize that later, but we can see that. I but. Mean, you, you could, go ahead. But. Jesus had the knowledge yes. of what Judas was going to do. So hypothetical, yes. would the Spirit have come to Judas if Judas had repented? Yes. Had Absolutely. Jesus went to him on his knees, he would have, yes. Yeah. And I just wanted to ask that because, and I knew you'd give the right answer, um, because, again, that leads us back to this whole thing. You are not in a spiritual minefield. Jesus is giving you the way, the truth, and the life. If you make a mistake, there's a way to fix it. And God is eager to, to forgive us. Thank you all for your questions, your comments, and your attention. We'll do this again on Wednesday, Lesson 1.8. Thanks.